that we're living in and the storms of life that we face that are so prevalent. We are thankful for the faculty <coughs> and all of the student body. God bless you today. Only eternity will tell what is being done here in this school. We live so close to things until so many times we don't see them. We can't see the forest for the trees, as the old saying goes. But I feel that God has chosen men to place them among us to perfect the body of Christ. And we do need perfecting. A man that thinks he has it made is a man that probably will never make it unless someone steers him straight. I feel young today because I'm amidst youth. You know, you may not understand that feeling, but someday you will. But uh, it's always a privilege to associate with you. I just look at you and I get inspiration. So I need to come more often so I can get inspired more often. Amen. We're blessed today to have the youth and Pentecost that we have. I can remember the first Pentecostal church I ever attended. I don't think there was any young people in it that had the Holy Ghost. And uh, I was in my early 20s. I knew nothing about Pentecost at all. And I <coughs> really didn't, didn't occur to me, I suppose, until later that there were no uh, young people in the church. But that didn't matter. It wasn't young people I was looking for. It was the truth. And uh, so many times, young people didn't stay in the church. But it really didn't matter to me because I was looking for the Lord and His will. And from then until now, I have been so thrilled to see young men and women live for God, stand for the Lord, and stand for the truth. So I really feel honored today to be here. I feel a good spirit. I thank God for what I've heard already. Thank God for the moving of the Holy Ghost in our midst. And I hope we'll keep it moving. I hope we'll let the Lord have his way. And I, Brother Lot asked me a few days ago to speak this morning in the service. I was talking with him on the phone. And I really have prayed and, and uh, taken to heart what the Lord would want me to say today to the student body. I wouldn't want to say something today that would not be an inspiration to you or that the Lord wouldn't have me to say. So I've just uh, prayed and uh, the Lord has impressed upon me a certain passage of Scripture and I'm going to read it to us today. Maybe uh, this is not what you think would be uh, the best thing for me to read and preach from. But if the Lord would help me, I'd like to read it anyway from the 12th chapter of the book of St. Luke. <clears throat> And I think I would like to read from verse 13 down through about perhaps verse 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? 
So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Almighty God, we're thankful today for the indelible Word of God. We're thankful today, Lord, that you have given a blueprint of life into our hands. And Lord, we're deeply grateful today that we're even allowed to know you and your great provisions that you have made. And Lord, we count it such an earnest privilege and honestly in our heart today, we thankfully acknowledge everything you have done, every word you have spoken, every blessing you have sent, every soul that has heard the truth, every man and woman that have obeyed the call of God and given of themselves. Bless this school. Bless this student body. Bless, I pray, God, every effort that's put forth. Bless the faculty. Bless the president. Bless the secretaries. Bless every individual that has anything to do with the word of God. And, Lord, not only with this service today, every service, Lord, in every classroom, Lord, let it feel the magnetizing presence of the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And will you say that name, Jesus? Amen. You may be seated. Today I'd like to ask the Lord to help us for a little while. And, uh, and I'd like to choose a subject today, if I may, for the next few minutes. Perhaps uh, it may be a little bit uh, far-fetched. In some ways, but one day it won't be. It won't be. Perhaps today uh, you're not to the point that you have to worry about uh, paying too much for what you buy and getting in debt too much and things like that. But uh, we all have a problem, and that is buying more than we can pay for. We all have a common problem. Everybody I've ever known has had this to a certain degree of getting their payments too high. I can remember when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, I had uh, had uh, some financial problems and I had just changed my course in life to a brand new direction. And things had kind of gotten a little tight and I was attempting to go to school and uh, the only kind of job I could find didn't pay very much. and. I think something like 50 cents an hour, and I was probably making, I think, $130 a month, and and I had uh, notes of $142 a month, just house note, car note, and, and insurance and things like that. And uh, I was uh, spending a lot more than I was taking in. I had my payments too high. Uh, and it was very difficult for a while to manage everything. Very embarrassing to meet someone that I owed and couldn't pay them. And it was very humiliating to meet a man on the street and him walk up to me and say, Say, when are you going to pay me what you owe me? And I said, I'm, I'm going to pay you. I'm making arrangements for it. And I did. I remember a man I owed, uh, I bought a car from him and he financed it for me, $1,000. And I went to him and told him, I said, I can't pay for the car. I'd like to just give it back to you. It's a good car and it's worth the money. He said, no. He said, I don't want to do that. He said, you just keep it. If you ever get the money, you pay me. If you don't, don't worry about it. And that made me feel so good toward that man. And hadn't have been for that, I don't know what I would have done. And two or three years later, uh, the Lord smiled on me. And one day I had a windfall that I wasn't really expecting. And uh, God just placed the money in my hands. And I called that man and told him I wanted to pay him and he came to my home that night and, and I paid him and asked him how much interest I owed him on the loan and he said, oh, I don't want to pay you. I don't want to charge you any interest. He said, I've never had anybody to be so honest with me. I would have given you that car and never expected a penny from you. I said, no, I couldn't do a thing like that. I would have to pay you. And so he's been a lifelong friend of mine. He's a very, very wealthy man today and, and he and I graduated from high school together he had nothing. He was flat broke and didn't have a cent. All he had was a claw hammer. He began driving nails, and today he, he is many times a millionaire and one of the best friends I have in the world. And he was a friend to me, and I never shall forget it. But I had my payments too high. 
And so I would like to choose for thought, but don't get your payments too high because you're living in a world today that's going to bind you and, and get you involved in something. Uh, this world is uh, it's of a spirit that it wants to bind every boy and girl, man and woman that, that intends to give their life to God. And you can get into it before you know it. And the most expensive thing in the world is money. Uh, go read this story and pay some attention to it when you read it. And this man's money cost him everything. He had plenty of money, lots of money, but it cost him. He had his payments too high. He was paying too much. And he had several virtues, though, that I'd like to mention to us because they command our respect and they literally command our admiration. They really command that we pay attention to it. This man uh, acquired his wealth honestly. He didn't steal it. He didn't uh, gamble for it. He was an honest man, apparently. From all indications, he was very honest and in seeking out uh, everything about this particular scripture, I don't find anything about this man that was a crook. Uh, I'm a boy that comes from a farm background, and so I understand this, this message, uh, this parable somewhat on some, in some elements of it. It said his ground brought forth plentifully. It brought forth plentifully. And ground doesn't always produce for everybody. Uh, some people could plant a garden and couldn't even, they couldn't even produce a radish uh, if they had the f most fertile land in the world. Some people can't even grow a tomato plant. And a fellow right next to them, he can produce everything, it seems. And that's the way we are. Uh, one man can take the same plot of ground and produce something on it another man cannot produce. And this man seemed to be quite blessed in... Uh, planting things and making a good crop. I used to pride myself on growing a good garden and uh, worked real hard at it and had the best tomatoes and, and the best of everything and just enjoyed it a whole lot. And I got to preaching and then got to pastoring a church and I'd go out to work my garden and folks come by and think of a problem they had and they'd stop and so I began to deal with problems instead of my garden and I lost my garden and didn't solve all the problems either. So I found a better way. I found out all the saints have gardens, and so I just tell them, bring it on by. And uh, I, don't, I don't really have to be too concerned about it anymore. They can make a garden better than I can. But uh, it's, it's a great thing growing crops in the ground. The ground's a wonderful thing. Um, I used to uh, take a great deal of pride in farming and always enjoyed it, producing things. I remember one time my dad told me, he said, uh, I was taking vocational agriculture in high school, and... He said, I'm going to give you uh, uh, six acres of the best, uh, best land we have on the, on the place. I'm I want you to plant half of it in corn and half in cotton. Of course, then cotton and corn were great crops. And, and I took that six acres and it almost killed me. Uh, I never worked as hard in all of my life to try to make the best crop on the place. And in spite of that, the grass almost took the cotton away from me. So uh, you never know, you know, what it takes to produce something until you watch somebody else do it, and then you try it. This man's ground brought forth plenty without him stealing. He didn't even inherit it. It wasn't even given to him by a rich father-in-law or mother-in-law or dad or mom or an aunt or somebody. Uh, he didn't even have a government subsidy. He just got out there and sweated and worked real hard, and, and we have to assume that he worked for it. Um, because ground just doesn't bring forth naturally. It takes a lot of hard work for it. It takes a lot of effort. And when you go and buy a lot of fertilizer and put it in the ground and then plant seed there, it better make because if it doesn't, you've had it. Uh, you, you're going to owe the bank a lot of money. It takes a lot of money to go into these uh, things. I used to uh, work for a feed company, and I'd go around selling fertilizer and feed and getting people into business and I remember one time I got a farmer <coughs> to put out, invest enough money to put out about uh, 20,000 laying hens. I had about 2 million hens on feed, and I was trying to build a little church and had a good job working for a feed company and uh, took my income and built a church with it, never asked home missions for a nickel. And we just paid the bills ourselves and built the church. And uh, I enjoyed working and, and helping people make money, and I saw a lot of people make money that got them invest. But this one man... 
he put in 20,000 hens and had about uh, two and a half a hen in them. And I think he sold probably about uh, three or four thousand dollars worth of eggs and all of a sudden cholera hit that flock. And he had to sell every one of them because the eggs couldn't be sold for hatching purposes. And that's what he had was a breeder flock. And uh, I remember him coming to me and saying, what am I gonna do? I owe the bank $45,000, how am I gonna pay this bill? And uh, it was a tragedy to him because he'd worked, he was a hard working man. Fortunately, we were able to uh, find an avenue for him to go into that he could pay the bill off and make, make money in farming. But it's hard, it isn't easy. It takes, uh, it takes sweat, it takes uh, heartache, and, and it takes a burden. It takes a wife uh, that can uh, walk side by side with a man in a time when things are looking like they're going in reverse. And there's a lot of things on a farm that don't look uh, just like what it really is. I remember as a boy growing up, we had a large farm. A lot of people lived on it. My stepfather had it rather, and my mother married him. And I came to that uh, farm, and lots of people there working. And I learned to work, and I learned to enjoy the work. And he had lots of cows, and these cows would have calves, and they were not milk cows, but uh, you had problems with mastitis and uh, the milk caking and causing disease and killing cows. So when they had a young calf, you had to go out and milk them. They might be as wild as a deer, but they had to be milked. You had to go put a rope on them and tie them to a tree or a post, and you had to get down there and milk that old cow. And I'll tell you this, if you don't know anything about milking a cow, you don't just go out there and set the bucket down and turn a hydrant on and fill it up. You, you got more to it than that. You got to sit down there under her, and she's walling her eyes around and prancing around, and you may have to get her up against a fence and put your head in her flank, and if she got an old long leg, she might break your neck before it's over. And I didn't know anything about Pentecost, of course. I was a high school student, and I was on the basketball team, and always uh, getting my knees skinned on the floor, playing basketball, and I remember that particular old cow he bought, and, and she, uh, she had a little calf, and he said, that cow gives a lot of milk. I said, you're gonna have to go milk her. So I went down there and put a rope on her, and, snubbed her and I began to get ready to milk her and I set my bucket down and had a big old sore on my knee where that hide had been skinned off on the gym floor and it was sore and I sat down there and I began to milk her and she'd been through wire and thorns and everything and her bag was sore and she was irritable and and all of a sudden before I realized it, she had one foot in my milk bucket and the other one on my sore and I never hurt so bad in my life I could have killed her easy Oh, I, if it wouldn't have been for my stepfather, I'd have just killed that cow right there. Because uh, it, it was tough. It hurt, you know. I, I was a grown boy, and, and I couldn't hold the tears back. They just rolled down my face anyhow. And I, and I did the very best I could to kill her by saying, you old cow, you, you know. And uh, so when you, when you face some things out there, well, you've got some prices to pay if you expect to get something out of it. And this man did it. I admire him for what he did in that particular thing. Uh, this particular farmer had the self-respect of the men around him. He could go to bed at night and sleep well with a clean conscience because he didn't, he didn't steal from them. He was well thought of. And there's really nothing wrong with acquiring wealth. I wish every one of you were millionaires. Praise God we could get an offering, couldn't we? A few, uh, few years ago, my youngest son, Brother Darrell McCoy, who's an evangelist now, was working here at the First City National Bank in Houston. He was supervisor of the coin vault there. And he, uh, when he graduated from high school, he said, I'll never go to school another day. I want to go to work for a bank. So he got a job in the bank there, and he was working uh, in the bank and went over to visit him one day, Brother Will Corn and I. Brother Corn was with us in revival. And so the vice president of the bank went down showing us all the money they had, and we walked in and, and uh, had just oodles of money. And, had a little stack of bills, I guess, about that high, and had a clamp over them, and a little uh, thing clamped on the top to hold them together, and the vice president reached over and picked up that little sheaf of bills and, and uh, took that little clamp off the top of it and take, took one bill out and handed me that bill, and I took it in my hand and looked at it, and it said $10,000. And uh, I, I handed it to Brother Corrin. I said, look at that, Brother Corrin. Brother Corrin took that $10,000 bill and held it up and looked at it and looked at the vice president of the bank and he said sir I have the oddest feeling coming over me 
And the bank president's, uh, vice president's eyes widened and surprise on his face. He said, sir, what kind of feeling do you have? He said, I have the feeling that I never wanted to take an offering as bad in all of my life. <laughs> so there's, there's really nothing wrong with acquiring wealth if we don't get our prerogatives in reverse. If we don't get our payments in the wrong direction too high. I would to God we all could be rich. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, this man uh, uh, had nothing wrong with building barns and eating and drinking and making merry. But there's one thing here that God did to this man that is well for us to take note of. He called him a fool. I don't like to use that word. I never have liked it. My mother whipped me for calling people a fool. I never was allowed to use that word growing up. A fool was, was off limits. We never could call anybody a fool. I couldn't call my brother a fool. I couldn't say to an old cow, you an old fool. I couldn't do that. My mother didn't allow it. Fool was out. It was out of order. And so this word has always gotten to me just a little bit. God called this man a fool. And so I interpret the word fool as being a man that has no judgment, a man without understanding, a man that has not been enlightened. And uh, whatever God meant, that's, uh, that's what he called a man. He called him a fool. And he called him a fool for several reasons. Perhaps I won't get uh, through all of these reasons this morning because I won't have that much time. But number one, the first reason he called him a fool was he forgot his giver. He began to think about all the gifts he had and he forgot who gave them to him. It never registered on him where they were coming from, where he was getting all of them. Notice, just go sometime and read this passage of Scripture and, and write down or underline or draw a circle around the times that he said, I and my and I and my and I and my and I and my. And, and that's what he had his mind on. He never thought of the giver. Look at the things he had. He was rich. He had everything that his soul could possess uh, in this world in the way of his body. But it was I. It was my. It was I and my. And Paul asked this question in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Everything you've got in this life, it was given to you. You don't have anything, really, that wasn't given to you. You may say, well, I worked for it. But still, there was a giver. This man claimed the money for himself, but God had given it to him, and he didn't stop to give God the praise and the honor and the glory. And we find ourselves in this predicament today. Paul said, If thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou didst not receive it? Why are we so human that the things we have that are placed in our hands and in our lives and we have made stewards over that we call our own? Why are we so carnal that we cannot give someone the thanks or the praise or, or thank them for praying for us or giving us what we've got because nothing that we have is our own. Take our health, for example. Uh, did you know we are, we are not very thankful for our health? Most of us are not thankful to God for the health we have in our bodies. Most of you today are taking your youth and your strength for granted. It's yours and it belongs to you. But do you realize there is a giver that gave you health? A giver gave you the health that you have. And uh, you don't realize how important it is until it's gone. I walk in hospitals every day almost of my life. And there are very few days that I don't go into a hospital and see a case that's impossible. I see a case that's dying. Just uh, a few weeks ago, I, there's a man that I've been in contact with for several years. And he has been rather careless with his health. He's been unconcerned. He was a man very strong. Uh, he could uh, do things I've never seen very many men that could do. He could just reach out and pick a whole barrel of things up. He was so strong. He prided himself in it. He never gave too much thought to where he got his strength and his health from. But cancer came and jumped on that man. And before he realized it, he was in the hospital and his, his health was gone. His strength was there no more. He told me lying on the hospital bed, he said, Brother McCoy, I remember when I could reach out and take hold of things that some men couldn't budge and I could lift it off the floor with one hand. He said, I would laugh at men that couldn't move anything. But he, and he was trembling. His very body was shaking and trembling because he didn't even have strength to stand without somebody holding him up. He couldn't talk on the phone very long from his hospital bed. Because he had no health. His strength had disappeared. 
If we have health today and that's the first ingredient that we need to do anything, let's remember where it came from. God gave it to us. God gave you the ability to be strong. God gave you the ability to lift your hands. We have people that go to Pentecostal assemblies that won't even take the time to honor God by lifting up two hands in a little Pentecostal worship service and say, God, I love you. God is the giver. We got these muscles and these tissues and these sinews because they were given to us. They're not ours. God gave them to us. We're on borrowed time, and we don't need to get our sight set on things in the world too much. We don't need to be paying more for other things than we should pay. We should give God the first payday with the praise of our lips. And I think we're a thankless people, and this man... He lay there in that bed, and the very last time I saw him alive, I walked in there about 3.30, and, and there he lay in a coma with his eyes half closed and his mouth uh, in the set that comes upon a man before he dies. And uh, as I laid my hands upon him and called his name, I said, I'm Brother McCoy, and I'm going to pray for you. And uh, very quickly, even in the coma, he sensed that I was there, and, and he, he tensed, and I felt his arms tense, and... His mouth changed and he began to mumble and his eyes looked up to try to see me. And I said, it's Brother McCaw, I'm praying for you. And he began to try to pray and he began to say words. I could not understand anything he said. Why? His strength was gone. His health was ended. In an hour and a half, he breathed his last breath. His health gone completely, not alive anymore. A, a man that had been one time stronger than most men, stronger than most men will ever be. But we don't seem to be thankful to God. And take our homes, for example. We grow up in a home, and we're really not thankful for it. There are, there are men and women who are married to each other, that they fuss over who will take the garbage out. They have divorces over uh, somebody writing a check for 10 or 15 or $20. They're not thankful to God. The home life isn't directed in the way that God wants it to be. Why? Because we take it for granted that everything is ours. My room is mine. My bed is mine. Everything belongs to me. That's my chair. That's my this and that's my that. We are a thankless people in the world today. And we Pentecostals, I want to say we that have the Holy Ghost, I say we that have spoken in tongues, we're not really thankful enough to God for giving us that gift to live in us. Oh, let me say to you today, students, that we need to remember the giver. And that's the greatest cardinal sin in the world today. We have forgotten the giver. He has given us all the things that we have. And you know, we are really not thankful enough to the giver for our fathers and mothers so many times. I remember as a, as a young man, I had a cold one time, and, and it grew into something bad. I had pneumonia. Only, only one time I remember a serious illness as a young boy, and I had pneumonia when I was about eight or nine years old. And uh, my mother after that was always afraid I'd take pneumonia and die. And I was playing basketball, and I thought every time they went, I had to go. I just had to be there. And I took a bad cold, and I was coughing, and, and we had a... We had a a game that had to be played and it was an important game and I had to be there because I was captain of the, of the basketball team and I was a high point man on the team and I just had to be there and my mother said to me you're not going to the ball game tonight and I said oh but I've got to go and she said but I said you're not going I said but mother you don't understand I have to go she said look don't say to me you have to go you are not going and I didn't go <laughs> and I thought boy isn't that terrible to have a mother like that you know but I look back now and I thank God for her I might not be here if I hadn't had a mother like that she gave me something that I needed she gave me discipline she gave me honor she taught me how to be honorable and how to respect those that have the rule over you and I thank God for her but you know a lot of times we don't even respect our mother and dad I know boys that don't even like to ride downtown with their dad. I know girls that don't even like to go anywhere with their mom. They feel great to go with me. A man in my church told me, he said, I don't understand my boy. He said he could get in the car with you and ride downtown or various places, and he thinks that's great. I'm with Brother McCoy. But he said, you know, he would never get in my car and ride downtown with me. He doesn't want to be seen with me. 
And that dad felt real bad in his heart about it. He didn't know why the generation gap was there. It goes back, we're not thankful enough to the giver. We're not thankful enough to mother and dad for what... That uh, we can realize that we can get our mind in channels of loving things that we love them too much and our payments are too high. We pay too much for it. And this man did that. Did you know life is not a stewardship? I mean, it's not an ownership. It's a stewardship. We don't own this thing that we've got called life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we shall take nothing out of it. You know, the man I admire so much is Moses. Moses is one of my great heroes of the Bible. And in Acts, Stephen said this about Moses. He was learned in all of the things of the Egyptians. He learned everything the Egyptians had to teach. But at the same time, he learned enough about his God to give him praise more than anything in the world. And there came a day he had the choice between all of the things of Egypt. And when I mention the things of Egypt... I mean things like language. I mean things like mathematics, hieroglyphics. I'm talking about the things that mattered in that day's world. And no doubt he had achieved a place as a military leader for the armies of Egypt. But when there came a time to make a choice, he had not driven his stakes so deep in the things of Egypt that he could not look at it and look at the things of God. And he said, I'll take this over here. I will not take that. I don't owe that system anything. I'm not indebted to them for one thing. It's true, Pharaoh's daughter raised me. She taught me everything there was to know. I learned everything in school. They gave me their best. I lived in the finest palace. I rubbed shoulders with the greatest educators in all of Egypt. I rubbed shoulders with Pharaoh. I rubbed shoulders with the leaders of nations. But it's come to the point now, I've got to make a choice. My payment to Egypt is paid. I'm not in debt to them. I don't owe them anything. My debt is to my giver. I give my all to him. I'm going with him. I'll follow him. I'll obey him. I love him. Thank God it was that little mom. It was that little mother. It was a little nobody unknown that put more of God in him than Pharaoh could put in him. Though they had him in the palace and she was just a slave nurse. I want to tell you something. She knew who the giver was and she let Moses know our great God Jehovah is the giver. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for the jobs. Thank God for the income. Thank God for the money. We've got to have it. But we don't owe them anything. We owe it all to God and the gospel to the world. And we can't give them what they need if we're too indebted to their way of life. This man had everything except one thing. He forgot. He forgot his giver. Everything we have is a loan and we've got to pay it back. And every one of you is a trustee to God. You're God's trustee. Be careful how you administer the goods of the Lord. Don't get your payments too high. Moses led those people. And in closing, I want to remind us of one thing. Over 113 nations today have constitutions written based upon the law of Moses. He got his education from Egypt, but he gave his praise to the giver. Hallelujah. You'll never learn too much to thank God for everything you know. Take your life today and fill it full of all the knowledge you can get of the world, but every day of your life, give yourself back to your giver. Hallelujah. Will you raise your hand and make a commitment to God right now? Will you give yourself to God? Will you give your life to God? Will you give everything you possess to God? Will you give your ingenuity to God? Will you give your education to God? Will you give your thoughts to God? Will you give all, every bit of the strength you'll ever have? Will you give it to God? Will you surrender it to God? Hallelujah.